Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to our service today as we celebrate the ninth Sunday after Pentecost. Special welcome to those who are joining us online and also those who are visiting with us this morning. Today as we study God's Word together, we notice that as we go through this life as Christians, we are not in a bubble, we are not isolated from the rest of the sinful world, but rather God's going to use this picture that we grow up in this world as wheat among the weeds. And yet, God says, even though this is the case, I promise to be with you, and I promise you at the harvest that I will take you to be with me where I am. We join in singing our first hymn this morning, Jehovah, Let Me Now Adore You. We'll sing the first two verses. in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful, and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us, and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ, and by his authority, I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. We join in singing verse 3 of our opening hymn. <laughs>
Grant us, Lord, the spirit to think and do what is right, that we who cannot do anything that is good without you may, by your help, be enabled to live according to your will. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Congregation may be seated. Our first lesson for this morning comes from 1 Peter chapter 4, beginning with the first verse. Peter reminds us that as we go through life, to remember that the world will continue to get evil and will continue to remind us that the end is near. Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude, because whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. As a result, they do not live the rest of their earthly lives for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. They are surprised that you do not join them in their reckless, wild living, and they heap abuse on you. But they will have to give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is the reason the gospel was preached, even to those who are now dead, so that they might be judged according to human standards in regard to the body, but live according to God in regard to the spirit. The end of all things is near. Therefore be alert and of sober mind, so that you may pray. Above all, love each other deeply, because love covers over a multitude of sins. This is the word of the Lord. I draw your attention to the questions that we have at the top of page 7. Explain the attitude of Christ with which Christians are to arm themselves. We see that mentioned in the first verse there. So explain that attitude with which Christians are to arm themselves. Go ahead, Carla. We shouldn't think that we're going to have an easy life because Christ also suffered, so we should expect to suffer too. Okay, we look at the, the life of Christ and what he suffered and, and de deducing even from reason can say, well, that's the kind of life we are going to face as well because of our connection to him. Good. Think of also the attitude that he had while in this world. Go ahead, Joseph. Remain firm in God's will despite what may be going on around you. Okay. Remaining firm in God's will in spite of what's going on around you. Think about uh, think of how he's resolutely set out towards the cross, even though he knew the pain and suffering that was coming. Uh, think about the humility that he went about his work, even though the creator of heaven and earth, he recognized that he could set aside making full use of that power and glory in order to fulfill God's will. List reasons why the sinful pagan world is surprised that we do not join in on their sin. Go ahead, Steve. Just to eat, drink, and be merry is the natural tendency for the sinful nature. And so it just seems like that would be what we'd want to choose, but we don't. Yeah, we seem like the strange, strange ones because we don't follow after our desires of the sinful nature, which we certainly still have. How else? Or what else do you see why the sinful world would be surprised at that? Uh, Mr. Davis. They don't see a reason. They don't understand what God is asking of them. So they don't see a reason to give up sinful desires and pleasures. Okay, they, they don't see the benefit or the blessings that come with giving up sinful, sinful desires, sinful pleasures. Good. And they just don't get it, do they? They don't get what is waiting for us. They don't get what it means to be a follower of Christ. They don't understand that when we when we follow our Savior, we don't want to sin any longer, and that simply doesn't make sense to them because they don't have that new nature that God has given each one of us. The third one there, explain the difference between being judged according to human standards in regard to the body and God's standard in regard to the spirit. How is it that we are judged in regard to human standards when it comes to the body, but God's standard when it comes to the spirit? Go ahead, Rich. No harm, no foul. Okay, the, uh, the uh, 
sinful nature or the, the sinful world would say, you can do it as long as it's not hurting anybody. Good. But even, even as Christians, how are we judged according to the body or in regards to the world, to the standards? Well, we have to follow what the government mandates okay. or legislates um, as long as it doesn't go contrary to God's word. But they cannot legislate our spiritual lives. And in that, we have to follow God. Okay, yeah, we, we, we certainly want to be good citizens of this world and follow the, the laws of the land and so forth, but yet we're not instructed what to believe spiritually. That, that comes only from God. And I think you also think along the lines of, uh, in regard to the body, people will, will judge us as, did this person live a good moral life or not? But that doesn't really necessarily count when it comes to God. His is a spiritual judgment have I put my trust in him and that will be evidenced by the way I live my life and finally the last one how does love cover over a multitude of sins <coughs> maybe you are a recipient of this love maybe you understand this in, in a very practical way Go ahead, Joseph I just say it reminds me of the Bible passage love is kind love is slow love is patient um, with love Okay, so you think of uh, 1 Corinthians 13 that he mentioned, that love is, the, is patient, it's kind, and it, it doesn't keep records of wrong, and so even though there is sin, there is, there is that forgiveness that comes with it. Go ahead, Mr. Davis. In love, Christ went to the cross and paid the price for all of our sins, the hugest multitude that there would be, ever be everyone's sin in the entire world. Okay, you think of that expression of love covering over the multitude of all people's sins, and and we have that not simply as an example, but we are the beneficiaries of that. Good. We now go on to our gospel for today, Matthew chapter 13, beginning with the 24th verse. Here we have a parable that Jesus tells about the wheat and the weeds growing together. Out of respect for the words and works of Jesus, please rise for the reading of our gospel. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, do you want us to go and pull up, pull them up? No, he answered. Because while you are pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. Then he left the crowd and went into the house. His disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. He answered, The one who sowed the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world, and the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people of the, people of the evil one, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Whoever has ears, let them hear. Here ends the gospel of our Lord. You may be seated. As you listen to that lesson, you have that first question. List the similarities and differences between the weeds and the wheat. They grow together. They grow together. Yeah, there's, they both grow. They both are, are active, you might say. They're living. What else do you see? They'll both be harvested. They will both be harvested. Yeah, well, go ahead, Rich. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. The devil sees the weeds as pretty good. 
where God sees the weak as being pleased with. Okay, so you have two two different perspectives on things. The devil sees what he sows as good for him, and God sees what he sows as good for him. And when they're first growing, you couldn't tell them apart, so you didn't know that one was wheat and one was weeds. Yeah, you uh, <coughs> you look at uh, the weeds that can be sown or the weeds that sometimes exist among the wheat. The two look identical until the fruit starts being, until the wheat starts growing, until the head starts appearing. Then then the difference is seen. But by that time, they're so intertwined, it's too late. Anything else? I suppose one of the biggest differences, one is beneficial and one's not. Uh, one, is, one is something that is, is sown in goodness and, and for God's glory, and the other is not. Uh, how do we see that in our world today? The weeds and the wheat growing together. Carla? appearance you can't necessarily tell who is the believer and who is not a believer by their acts sure there are there are many morally good unbelievers in the world and sometimes there's pretty lousy christians in the world too but rich we don't live in christian colonies we live wherever we buy a house and our neighbors may be christians they may be not yeah, you think of your own neighborhood where you live, and your neighbor may be a Christian, maybe not. Maybe uh, some other denomination, maybe not. Maybe some other religion, maybe not. Maybe nothing. And yet, you grow side by side together. Uh, explain how a Christian today would be uprooted with the weeds today if God were to pull the weeds. It's kind of an interesting picture that he poses there and says, just leave them because the weed actually might be uprooted in the whole process. Go ahead, Addison. Uh, yeah, I couldn't quite hear it, but uh, I assume it was a good answer. <laughs> Go ahead, Carla. Um, they might, just because it starts out as a weed, and I know this doesn't happen in real life, but it can become a belief. This, the unbeliever can become a believer if they're wiped out too soon that ends their time of grace to, to come to know Jesus. Sure, that, uh, that God allows people to exist for this time of grace in order to come to faith. Go ahead, Rich. And since we still have a sinful nature, sometimes if, if the harvester came by when we were sinning, they might pull us out. Okay. And I'm going to make the assumption that when the harvesters come, I'm going to be sitting at the time just because of the simple nature that, I, that I'm in. But perhaps it, I, I look at that and say, you, you hear the accusation of God today, don't you? How could a loving God do that? Well, if I'm at a point where I'm weak in my faith, maybe I do end up getting plucked up with that and, and losing my faith. And so God says, no, we're, we're going to let them grow side by side. And then at the harvest, we'll make the separation. Uh, finally, name the blessings that come from the Lord allowing the wheat and the weeds to continue to grow side by side. I think uh, we, we had one of them mentioned already. You think of that time of grace that we have, uh, that maybe that person who is an unbeliever, maybe that person comes to faith. Uh, what's another one? It gives us time to make a choice. Okay. In, in what we, sense? If, if we either choose the Lord or we choose the world. Okay. Yeah, I can I can simply walk away from God and and uh, decide I, I want nothing to do with Him, or God continues to work in my heart and by His grace He brings me to to that faith. Um, you, you think of uh, think of the picture that God uses or that Jesus uses in Scripture. He says, "You are the salt of the earth." Well, how are you the salt of the earth? Think of what salt does. It preserves and so God allows us to grow side by side with his people prolonging their time of grace as well and also salt can be used to season other people can't it and so God sees our or people see our faith in action and we are that witness to them through his word this ends our Bible study portion of the service
I now invite you to join in confessing your Christian faith with the words of the Nicene Creed. Please stand. We join together. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We join in singing our next hymn, For Jesus Christ with us abide. You may be seated. from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The word of God for our consideration this morning comes from the Old Testament book of Joel, chapter 3, beginning with the 12th verse. Let the nations be roused. Let them advance into the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there I will sit to judge all the nations on every side. Swing the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, trample the grapes, for the winepress is full and the vats overflow. So great is their wickedness. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and moon will be darkened, and the stars no longer shine. The Lord will roar from Zion and thunder from Jerusalem. The earth and the heavens will tremble. But the Lord will be a refuge for his people, a stronghold for the people of Israel. This is the word of the Lord. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, this last month when I was on vacation in Wisconsin, you could tell very easily that the growing season was in full swing. Maybe if you're from the Midwest, you remember that old saying, 
The sweet corn should be knee high by the 4th of July. Well, with the advancements in agriculture, now there's a new saying, and in fact, this was also true, it should be as high as an elephant's eye, is the new saying. And it was. And you could see things were greened up, things were growing. My in-laws have a garden, they had a few peppers that were ready for the picking. In fact, this last week, my nephew just sent a Snapchat video. He's a senior in high school, but has gotten into gardening. And a, a video of he and his grandpa pickling cucumbers, making pickles. So the, you can tell the harvest is almost near. You know, I have a few other family members who have decent sized gardens and they like to grow tomatoes. When the end of the season comes, the end of the growing season comes, they can them. And they usually can about 400 quarts of tomato juice, stewed tomatoes, tomato sauce, salsa, spaghetti sauce, all sorts of things. Now, if you are not into canning, the idea of picking about 50 buckets of tomatoes and canning all of them, that's quite a process, could be kind of daunting. But if you're into it, boy, those are the, the, the memories are made there, the joy that comes to see the harvest that you can bring from the, the ground that God has blessed you with, it's a good thing. Well, this morning in our lesson, we are going to see the prophet Joel talk about the harvest. And he's going to tell us that the harvest is almost here. Now, depending on which side of things you are on, you can look at that harvest. And in, in the one sense, it could be rather daunting because of a lack of faith in God and the, the eternal sentence that will come. Or on the other hand, it, we can look at this harvest as a delight. Because God tells us this is when all of those promises that he has made to believers become that reality. Now, as we look at this lesson from Joel, we have to be honest, we don't know a whole lot about this prophet. We, don't, we can't exactly pinpoint when he was active. But there is one thing that he makes abundantly clear at the beginning of his book. The nation had faced kind of a national tragedy as a bit of judgment, as a call to repentance for the people. The land was ravaged by a plague of locusts. In the opening chapter, he says, What the locust swarm has left, the great locusts have eaten. What the great locusts have left, the young locusts have eaten. What the young locusts have left, other locusts have eaten. Have eaten. Kind of an ironic picture, isn't it, that he's talking about harvesting in our lesson today and there wasn't going to be any kind of harvest because of this plague of locusts. There was destruction. There was devastation in the land. And now Joel's going to tell us it, it's not the time to blame God. It's not the time to point fingers at one another. It's not the time to rally the people and say, well, let's pull ourselves up by our own sandal straps. Now he says it's time to repent. The sin of the people is the one that they always seem to struggle with. It's the one that's still prevalent today. They struggled with idolatry. And now here's where the irony comes in. Because he says these locusts have devastated the land and yet there is going to be a harvest. He says in our lesson today, let the nations be roused. Let them advance into the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there I will judge all the nations on every side. Swing the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come trample the grapes, for the winepress is full and the vats overflow. So great is their wickedness. The fullness of the nation's wickedness had matured. Picture for yourself as you're walking through a vineyard and you can see those grapevines are just plump with grapes and weighted down, are, are really begging to be harvested. Well, Joel says that's really what the sinful world has done. That's really where they sit. They have 
accumulated this wickedness. They have stored up this wickedness. They have defied God in such a way that they are really just begging to be harvested. But this harvest isn't going to be a joy for them. It's not going to be a delight for them. No, he gives his harvesters the instruction, swing the sickle. Get the wine pressed up and going and trample these grapes underneath. Trample them in judgment. Meet in the valley of Jehoshaphat, and Jehoshaphat's name means the Lord judges. Meet in that valley because judgment is coming. It's going to be swift. It's going to be strong. It's going to be decisive. It's going to be destructive. Joel says, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon will be darkened. The stars no longer shine. The Lord will roar from Zion and thunder from Jerusalem. The earth and the heavens will tremble. Elements of nature don't even want to cast their eyes on this destruction. They don't even want to cast their eyes on this wickedness that the sinful world has stored up for itself. Because God's bringing his judgment. He's going to thunder. He's going to roar. He's going to bring that destruction to those who had defied him and provoked his wrath. As you look at this lesson for today, I couldn't help but be reminded of where we are today. And see, there's some similarities. They face the national tragedy of this plague of locusts. You might say we're facing a national tragedy of a pandemic. And things don't necessarily look all that different, do they? We look at the world around us, we look at our country, we look at everything and say, look at how the harvest is ripe. Look at how wickedness seems to abound. You think of where we are when it comes to showing basic human decency to one another. That seems to have gone completely out the window, hasn't it? You look at the headlines, you look at what is going on in our country. Not too far south of here, maybe you saw this. A couple was eating a picnic lunch together and someone attacked them with pepper spray because they weren't wearing masks. Another gentleman went into a hotel and he saw a mom and her son sitting there and he opened fire because they weren't so social distancing. Basic human decency seems to have gone out the window. Or you think of where we are in regards to people showing respect to authorities, both the police and politicians, that's completely declined. You see where people are when it comes to destruction? Of other people's property and that's on the rise and then we have human trafficking physical abuse sexual abuse you think of all the problems the the epidemic we have when it comes to drug abuse during this time of pandemic we're told that domestic abuse is on the rise people abusing substances is on the rise and so as we look at it all around us yeah, the harvest looks pretty full, doesn't it? But what about us? Before we look at it and say, well, you're not going to find my face in any of those news articles. You're not going to find me showing this disrespect by spitting in somebody's face, or I'm not in favor of defunding anything. But don't we find ourselves, at times, throwing that sense of human decency out the window? You think of when you deal with customer service and how aggravating that can be. And yet, what do we find ourselves doing sometimes? Taking it out on that poor person who was just lucky enough to answer the phone for us. Or think of the judgments that we make with one another. It doesn't have to be when it comes to how they handle this pandemic. It could be we judge somebody in their relationship. How they raise their children or the way they spend their money and we have an opinion on it. You see, we are just as guilty as the people in Israel's day. We are just as guilty as fashioning our own idols. No, they may not sit on our mantle. 
Maybe they hang on our wall or are parked in our garage. Maybe we tuck them in at night and kiss them goodnight. You see, the wickedness that abounds in the world is something that you and I struggle with as well. Sometimes we look more like weeds than we do like wheat, don't we? What God should do is the same thing that he said was coming for the people of Israel. He should send his harvesters to raise the sickle, to bundle us up and throw us in the fire. He should throw us in his wine press and stomp us with his righteousness and his justice for his judgment. But God doesn't do that. He doesn't want to do that. In fact, he says, I don't want to see the wicked perish. I don't find joy in, in the wicked being punished. I want people to seek me. I want people to live. I want people to have hope. And he says, I'm the one that provides it. As you listen to this lesson for today, you heard all about this valley of decision, all about this judgment, all about this harvest that was coming. But don't miss the very last two lines of the last verse of our lesson. Joel tells us, but the Lord will be a refuge for his people, a stronghold for the people of Israel. Safety, security, salvation, that's all found in the Lord. And he promises us that safety, security, and salvation. Joel wanted his people to turn from their wicked ways. He wanted the nations around him to turn from their wicked ways. Because the solution was right there in front of them. Think especially about the people of Israel. He knew that they were the ones who carried the promise of the Messiah. They were the ones who had been given the revealed will and word of God. And he didn't want them to miss what God had said. Your salvation, your security, your refuge is found in the Lord. No wickedness, no evil, no enemy of God can penetrate that because the Lord is a stronghold. And that promise is fulfilled through Jesus. Now you think about Jesus for a moment and you think, boy, if anybody was a victim of human indecency, it was him, wasn't it? He wasn't shown the respect he rightly deserves as creator of the world. He wasn't honored he was spit upon, he was mocked, he was brutalized. He felt the full punishment of God's sickle in his suffering. He had every last ounce of his life squeezed out of him in God's wine press of judgment. But not because of himself, but because of us. That was because of us, because of you and me, when we show those acts of human indecency. When we make those judgments on people because of the way they live their lives and we hold them up to our standards rather than God's standards. It was because of us that Jesus went to that cross and faced God's justice. But the beautiful thing is, is at Jesus' cross, that's where God's justice and his love meet. Because there Jesus says God's justice has been satisfied. God's justice has been satisfied to the point that you are not held accountable for your sin any longer because the payment was already made. At his resurrection, God declared that his payment for sin that Jesus made was sufficient for you and me. So even as we go through this world and we see the ripeness of of wickedness and we have to admit at times you and I we were just as ripe to the nose stinging the eyes with our wickedness and yet God says what I have done for you in Jesus is satisfied my justice and given you a place to flee Jesus is your refuge your stronghold the place that 
you are safe and secure. As we think of that thought of the harvest being near, maybe you've seen it before. That plant that, that seems so swollen with fruit that it can barely hold itself up any longer, anymore, it begins to buckle under the weight of the fruit. We think to ourselves, somebody needs to pick it. That needs to happen soon, otherwise the plant is going to be ruined. Well, look around you. Isn't the wickedness of this world continuing to increase and the harvest coming? God says the harvest is almost here. For some, it's a daunting thing, isn't it? For some, they look at it and say, this is the time I'm going to meet my maker. And they're going to have to answer for their, their actions. We heard that earlier in our, our second lesson. They will have to answer to God. But for us, the harvest is a delight. Because then God will gather us to himself and take us to be with him forever. There we will enjoy all the blessings of his promises that he has made to us and live out our eternity with him. We pray today, come Lord Jesus. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. This time we are reminded of our offering. There, there is an offering place for when you leave if you would like to make a donation. And also we encourage you to use our online giving platform or set up bill pay. You may be seated. God, we thank you for the wondrous gift of Jesus Christ, your Son, and for the promised graces we have received through him. We thank you that through his perfect life and his obedience to death on the cross, we have, we have been granted cleansing and pardon for all our sins. We thank you that in his resurrection we have the promise of life everlasting, and that in his ascension to the right hand of your majesty we have the assurance that he continually intercedes for us. Help us believe and trust in him, love and serve him, and in all our thoughts, words, and actions, we may manifest his spirit. Rebuke our selfishness and subdue our self-indulgence. Deepen our sympathies, strengthen our hope, and confirm us in our faith. Dwell in our homes, O Lord, and let the trust of our families be centered in you alone, so that no difficulty, trial, or adversity rob us of the conviction that you are our helper in every time of need. Relieve the afflictions of the weary and the sick, and dry the tears of those troubled and sorrowful. Lead them to look to you as the unfailing spring of healing and hope. All these things we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior and Lord. And in his name we also join in praying. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We join in singing our communion verse, Draw near and take the body of the Lord.
Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. We praise you, Lord Jesus, for your journey on this earth. By your obedience, you overcame the assaults of the devil and gave your life as a ransom for many. You have cleansed our hearts and given us your victory over death. Now prepare our hearts to receive your true body and blood and give us the sure hope of celebrating the eternal wedding feast with you. Teach us, Lord, to walk in your ways. In your name we pray. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. We join in singing our verse 3 of our communion here. The Bible teaches us that the Lord's Supper together signifies a oneness in faith, life, and worship. And therefore, out of Christian love for one another, we ask that those who are not confirmed members of Living Hope or one of the churches in the Wisconsin Synod or the Evangelical Lutheran Synod, please speak to me before coming to the Lord's table. I'd be happy to speak with you on the basis of God's Word on how you might commune with us in the future. Just by way of instruction, we will invite you forward at the direction of the usher to come up through the center aisle, and then if you can peel off through the side, uh, first receive the bread from Mr. Kunert, and he will say the body of Christ, and then come over to this side, and I will give you the wine with the blood of Christ, and then we will have a final dismissal once everyone is seated. Thank you.
Now may this true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and keep you in the true and saving faith to life everlasting. Depart in peace. Your sins are forgiven. Amen. When we join in giving thanks. Please stand. <laughs> oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. And, and his mercy endures forever. We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this holy supper. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. We close our service with the singing of the last hymn. Almighty Father, bless the word. You may be seated. Once again, blessed good morning to all of you. Thank you for joining us for our outdoor service. Hopefully this week was a little bit cooler for most of you than last week. Uh, we will plan again to continue until further notice at 8.30 in the morning and right in this location again, since we get a pretty good relief from the sun in this area. Uh, if you haven't done so yet, uh, the latest issue of Forwarding Christ and also Meditations, the tail end of this one is still coming till the end of August, but those are available at the at the table here. And also, if you do have an offering, there is the collection plate that is there as well. I wish you all a blessed day.